The Story of the Chestnut Tree Long ago in a place not far, a place you may have wandered not that far ago in time, Perhaps on a trip into a rustling bunch of trees, you had chance to look up and filled with wonder at how far one would have to climb to reach the upper border, the canopy of branches that reached toward the heavens, like columns in a grand cathedral, or a collection of long, thin ropes let down for a rescue. Perhaps in wonder as you twirled at the sight round and round, you may have tripped and fallen, and now the sight lay ahead and not on top. The world appears different after a fall, which can happen from time to time. Perhaps a bit dizzy, you see before you what was like a ceiling become like a wall. Something similar to what some call an iconostasis. That means, of course, a type of wall that hides and reveals at the same time. What is hidden is shown by hiding it. For if what was hidden was shown, you still wouldn't be able to see it. So it is left hidden as a reminder to remember there are some things that the eyes we have cannot see for now. So close the eyes you have for now and let the eyes of your heart open. Long ago, in this very place, there grew something wondrous to behold. It made the trees we have now look very, very small. Its canopy rose far above them, and branches scored at times twice as far. It grew quite fast, and the amount of time an oak reached the size of a baseball bat. This one was the size of a railroad tie. Those big logs cut in square shapes and laid on their sides to steady the rails for the trains that passed by. Bulky figures with sharp axes could chop them right down to the base, coppice them as they would say, and soon after a little twig would rise and before a small child would grow large, this one would be large once more. Those that had grown the oldest had trunks the size of elephants, that is, the whole elephant, and not simply his trunk. It would take a line of many big trucks to be as wide as its top, and its height would make a large house look like a tiny dwarf standing in awe by its roots. The time that school would release for the summer would be marked by its white blossoms decorating the forest long after the trees, other trees, had blossomed and finished. It would almost make the forest appear as filled with snow at the same time the corn was knee high. As fall arrived, the crop of nuts more likened to corn than nuts would fall. One could carve a cross on them and roast them, thicken a hearty soup, or dry and drown them to make bread from the flour. Eating just a few would fill you like a big meal, no matter how big and strong and hungry you were. And if one was sick, it was especially good to eat, as it was known to heal. Several times more than a great corn harvest was this tree, but much less effort and toil. The planting needed to happen only once, and after the third year, every year, its harvest would gather itself and lay waiting on the ground. Its crop was bountiful year after year, so much, in fact, that groups of birds would lie on it for food. The oak blossomed earlier and were sometimes caught by a frost before they could produce their fall crop of acorns, proving to be not as steady a supply. Unlike the nuts from these, they were not bitter, but sweet, like bread that had been flavored with honey. The nuts fell at the feet of many who were very poor and lived in the mountains. To them, 
These nuts brought what they needed when traded at the market to others from the city, who eagerly awaited the sweet crop. The leftovers of what had fallen was gobbled up, fattening the boars and sows, the pigs, for harvest at little cost to the farmers. The animals sought them out feverishly, just as the bees had sought out the white blossoms in the summer and had taken them back to the hive. There ripened yet another crop of honey. As if this weren't enough, the bark contained something called tannin in such great supply as to be the best for tanning the hides of creatures whose skin were preserved by it and made into leather. So fruitful was this tree, and yet well guarded, for its precious fruit lay hidden in a thorny ball of spikes. If it were attempted to be opened at too early a moment, a consequence would follow of thorns stuck in the flesh of one's fingertips, which took a great deal of time to get out, and its needles were, needless to say, painful. And yet, when the time was right, it would open on its own, with little effort, sharing the beauty of its fruit to whoever was destined to receive it. For centuries, an art of Europe, where a cousin of this American grew, there were specimens so large they were able to feed and hide armies. So fruitful it was that they likened it to be a symbol of a great mother who bore a gift from heaven and a symbol of chastity. One can find paintings of the Blessed Virgin and the saints of different ages depicted in the branches, filling the big tree. Across the ocean, what some called the New World, it was larger and sweeter, and named the Redwood of the East. One in four trees was one of these, and after all its years of fruitful gift, the wood itself was harvested. For unlike other wood, it would not rot, so they used it for building barns and houses and just about everything. What wood was left over to burn was special in that it was great for kindling. It split quite easily, and the tannin inside made it spark lively once lit, turning a small flame quickly into a great roaring fire, warming its company. They were plentiful, needing to be plentiful, for they needed two or three in order to produce a harvest. But of course, there were plenty. That begs a question. Why is it now we see so few? What happened? It was the age when people were interested in having whatever they wanted, especially from distant places. They traveled far and brought back the trees from a distance from east to west. They were brought to the city and placed in an exhibit for all to see the wonders that had come from a distance and to display the great wealth available that had brought it such a great distance to see. Unknown to those who transported the trees across the sea, on the stems one could hardly see a little spotting. It seemed to the eye harmless, if even noticed at all. But once placed where it did not previously belong, something happened. Those little spots spread to the skins, the barks of those nearby. But unlike the eastern hosts, these trees did not know these spots. They were not ready for them. They were not armed to fight them, and so they were overtaken one by one by the little spots which had seemed so harmless. The first to become sick were those closest to the city exhibit, and farther and farther it spread like waves in an ocean. At first there were only a few dots on each trunk, then many more grew until they surrounded the great trunk, cutting it off from the life which flowed up from the roots. It choked them all of life gradually. One by one, the great trees lost their abundant leaves and fruit. Their bark aged and dried and fell to the ground around it. And marked and exposed, they became like ghosts. They tried everything to save them, but nothing worked.
Those in charge made law requiring all in the infected area to be chopped down, and so even the healthy and resistant, which might have survived and multiplied to save them, were destroyed with the sick. The wood of them both was loaded onto trucks and driven great distances to carpentry shops to make use of their remains. Even the last of these scattered splinters used for kindling while it lasted. What was thought to be a solution proved to quicken the demise. As far as the trucks could drive, they spread the little spots until there was no place in all of Appalachia where they could not be seen. As the age came, when the stock market crashed, wealth dried up in the cities and mountains alike. There were no more nuts to fatten the pigs, and so they were too expensive to fatten, and no profit was left to feed the farmers in the mountains. The blossoms, too, had disappeared, causing the bees to look elsewhere for food, and so the honey dried up, too. Those that made their income from the cutting and harvesting of trees for wood now found few that could be harvested as often or as big. For none grew as fast or as big as had such valuable rot-free wood as the, as the big old tree. For a while, the bark was everywhere to be harvested, but soon it became quite rare, cutting off the supply for those who used it to tan the hides that were made into leather that had once been sold with the honey and the nuts and the wood and the pigs to meet the needs of the farmers in the woods. We now had to pack up and move to the cities and factories. Harsh conditions awaited them there. Wide open fields and rich woodlands gave way to cramped apartments and small filled streets. The time of many small family farms in the mountains came to an end, and many cried and left cried as they left, remembering the loss of the great tree, which had fed and provided for them. Birds that relied on their on them too, called passenger pigeons, grew few and disappeared, no longer having food to supply their winter in abundance. Ten, thirty, fifty years passed. Billions had become millions, millions became thousands, thousands had become hundreds, and hundreds had become just a few. For a while the skeletons stood. They did not rot in the weather, for they were eventually bore through by insects creating holes through them. It is for this reason the last of the wood harvested is called wormy. It showed the last wounds of an age of giants, and was often so disfigured and cheaply acquired, for few if any wanted it any more. It seemed useless now, save to create bulk for furniture, to be covered over by paneling to make it look like oak, but be produced more cheaply for the market. And so the last of its wood passed unseen under oak laminate and cheap furniture, at least cheap furniture of the time. Soon even the memory of these giants slipped from the minds of those who had gone to move toward the cities they no longer even remembered. They seemed all now to be of no help, to be forgotten, lost. But were they lost or only hidden? You see, as it turns out, the little spots had no power in the ground. There was something in the soil that defeated it there, at least there, and so unknown to many, there remain great relics of an age past still alive. As great as they had once towered above, they still towered below, descending to great depths like sunken ships in a deep, dark ocean. But unlike the ships, which though preserved rotted, these giant masses of deep roots spread alive still deeper. On the surface, they would be small shoots attempted each year, unceasingly, hardly lasting more than a year before the little spots would appear and would be once again chopped back to the roots.
unintimidated by its relentless failure, it gently tried each year to rise once more, never abandoning the hopeful attempt, each year trying again to defeat, to overcome the little spots. One might never known or seen such a noble fight, which still now fills the corners and depths of the forest as far as the eye can see, and still the eyes that see often do not see them. To many who struggle, it may remind them of something inside them. Something may feel like it was great, but fallen, crippled, weak, awaiting healing and the ability to defeat what leaves it feeling crippled and small. Perhaps there is a lesson there in the spots, in the sprouting each year of the little twigs, once giants. The little spots have not yet won. They have only made occasion for a great struggle, for hope, for roots to grow still deeper, in the winter of waiting, for a resurrection, for a triumph yet to come. Sometimes people say everything is broken, unfixable, crippled, sick, lost. But is it? Is this only a time for roots to grow deeper in preparation for rising again? For is it not true that love always triumphs and that evil, no matter how dark, will never have the last word? The final word has already been spoken by another, at whose very voice the little spots will one day lose what power they have, and the great giant's roots, now more deeply spread, will grow greater than before. They will rain down manna in the midst of drought and famine, taking away the sting of suffering, feeding the hungry, healing the sick and the wounded and setting the laborers free from their toil and heavy burdens. Again will return the symbol of a mother gathering, feeding, and guarding her children under her outstretched arms of chaste love, honor, glory, power, and might. As the defeat of a great tree once accompanied a time of great loss, so one day the same tree, free from the little spots, will rise towards heaven and announce the coming of a new age, a new kingdom. But as for now, what can be done? Are all efforts useless? Can we only wait? Or is it possible to gather seeds and plant them one by one? There are some today that have the gift of science and use it for the good of all. They examine closely the little spots to see if there is any way they can help the old giant. They use their whole life's effort and those around them to see if anything present can help. Apparently there is a possible solution found in wheat. Oxalic acid found in the grains of wheat seem to weaken the little spots. It does not make them disappear but prevents them from causing harm to the tree, who once were big. Perhaps something like this can be done for us too. We can use our whole lives' strength and what gifts we have to do what we can. We shouldn't simply give up, wait, and do nothing. There is much that we, though small, can do. Let us do as these great roots do. Let us attempt each day to grow, love each other, one person, one day at a time. And when we feel defeated, try again. Hope, love, grow deeper. Gather our strength from the roots. Even when, plant and, even when we plant and nothing happens, plant a seed again. Take note from the great trees that they could only thrive when two or three, for such was the design from the beginning. Many are tempted by evil to hide alone. Wasn't a gathering in a garden the original plan? Happiness found together. The growing of a common crop can be occasion to talk, to share, to love, and to give. 
to learn to be happy with little and to find power and at times having no power at all. As a wise old Russian woman once said, love, 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 never counting the cost. The little spots had no power over the roots in the ground. Our roots are love. <laughs>